Anyway, uh, Barry asked me to give this uh, presentation on standards before, and I must admit I've never actually presented on standards before. I've worked a lot on standards. I chaired the ASPRS committee for a while, and I've worked on data standards, um, guidelines for accuracy reporting. I've uh, worked on a lot of project uh, specifications and um, request for proposal uh, contracts. So it, it's, it's a topic I'm very familiar with, but the idea of presenting on it has never really occurred to me before, because to be perfectly frank, it's a very dry topic. It isn't really as entertaining as uh, well, the last hour of uh, material that we've gone through. So I, when I started to tackle this topic, I thought, well, how do I do this? You know, there's a lot of standards and guidelines out there, but this presentation could very quickly devolve into a shopping list of criteria. And I didn't really want it to do that. So I, I tried to stand back a little bit. And what I hope to present is uh, sort of the issues that an end user might encounter that would lead you to want project specifications and guidelines. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to end up with, um, just to give you an introduction to what some of those standards are. I don't want to give you that shopping list. Um, because at the end of the day, standards are very user specific, very you know, um, project specific. Uh, they're driven by the end user needs. And uh, there's, a, there's quite a cross section of end users here, so I don't want to talk about uh, standards of flood mapping when most people might be interested in forestry, for example. So. Uh, Hopefully, I'll, I'll try to give you a high-level overview, but also get into quite some specifics. Okay, so first of all, what are standards? Well, I went to that uh, fountain of knowledge and information on Wikipedia and just got a definition for you. Technical standards is an established norm or requirement about technical systems. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're dealing with ASTM or IEEE or ISO standards or anything like that. And that's good, because really, there aren't many of those when it comes to our um, industry. But there are a lot of... Um, guidelines or specifications out there that we could consider to be established norms or requirements. And so, given the criteria we have here, we'll consider those standards for the purpose of this discussion. So the outline of my talk, I'd like to start off just by presenting some of the community's needs. Why, why are standards or guidelines or specifications actually of value to us? Um, and then to provide some context or as well, discuss a typical project workflow. Now, of course, the workflow from <coughs> project inception or proposal all the way through to you know, um, an end user's um, decision support system is a very, very long workflow. Um, for the purpose of this decision, I want to focus more on data acquisition, you know, that aspect of the workflow. Um, and then when it comes to data delivery, what are some of the end user challenges? You know, what are the types of uh, problems with data um, specifications that end users commonly encounter? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, and of course, that a big part of that component is, is quality assurance um, and, uh, and accuracy, validation, that kind of thing. So I've actually pulled that out as a, as a separate uh, um, uh, part of the talk. Now I've got a very small section dealing with uh, North American standards and guidelines examples. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of these things, I just want to kind of introduce the concept of there are some of these things out there. And then I just want to fin finish up a little bit of plug, as did Nicholas, he had a plug, so I'm going to have a plug for this LIDAR Institute concept that we're trying to develop. Okay, so the, the community need, what, what's the issue? Well, I've broken this down into three components. Very often you'll find that after data are delivered, an end user, you know, let's just hypothetically say a government stakeholder, might feel that their expectations have not been met. Now fortunately, I think this is less and less and less the case. But 10 years ago, it was very frequent that this would happen. Um, that, you know, an end user might have been sold on on what the data could do by some um, you know, overzealous uh, salesman, perhaps. And uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that may be. Perhaps the, um, the expectations are poorly defined from the end user's perspective. Uh, maybe they were unreasonable. You know, maybe the technologies just couldn't do what was expected. Maybe the, um, the end user department just didn't have the uh, capacity or the internal resources um, or the knowledge. Uh, and so you know, there's this um, discrepancy between expectations and, and deliverables. Now one of the kind of external factors is uh, that what we've seen, and I illustrated this yesterday, is around about 10 to 20 percent growth per year in all aspects of the industry, and hopefully that's still the case today. And so what we've uh, seen is kind of a catch-up process, both on the manufacturer, the service provider side, but also on the end user side. You know, we're always trying to catch up to you know, where the technology is at. Um, there's always a bit of an expertise deficit, and so you know that creates its own uh, natural challenges when you're in a situation of growth. 
There's a dynamic market. You know, we see that the technology is constantly evolving. It's getting faster, uh, more accurate. Um, new applications are being developed. Um, um, end users started, are starting to discover uh, that they have new needs, that they can do more with the data. Um, so it's a very dynamic uh, marketplace overall. So um, I believe that that leads us to a situation where guideline standards certification are actually very helpful in, in, a, in a few different ways. Those guideline standards certifications can actually provide input to this communication process. They can help the communication between industry and, and end users. You know, by having the, this framework of guidelines, it helps us to uh, communicate our needs uh, and deliverables. It can also provide the backbone for training. Because obviously, if we have expertise deficits within the community, then we need some kind of guidance as to what needs to be trained. So again, standards can provide that, that guidance. And then, of course, you know, standards and guidelines need to evolve. They need to keep up. You know, they can't remain static in a, in a very rapidly moving environment. So we need applied research to actually feed into these, these standards and guidelines. <coughs> so what's the purpose of, the, of standards? You know, what should they do? Well, I'm just, this is one of these shopping lists. They should promote product consistency, improve data reporting and quality. And I'm going to come back to data reporting and quality a number of times throughout the presentation. It's a really uh, important topic. And how's user accessibility? I think it, it came out yesterday that that was one of, one of the challenges that's um, quite apparent is that, uh, yeah, it's, it's great that we've got these data sets, these point claims, for example, but how many, how many of us are stuck using rasters and ArcGIS? You know, but there's so much more we can do. So we need to improve that accessibility. We need to be able to do more with the data. We know we can do more with it, but, but, but how do we actually get in and how do we do it? So guidelines, standards can help in terms of accessibility. We want to reduce unnecessary and unforeseen costs. You know, we don't want to have to do the same thing over and over again or have different departments duplicating the way things are done. Or um, if a task can be done at the server is can be done more effectively at the service provider end than the end user end, or vice versa, you know, and then hopefully um, a guideline can reduce costs on that. <coughs> Increase collaboration data sharing if desired. Um, and I will come back to that later on when we talk about national mapping in, in the United States. Maximize data use across application uh, user domains. Support optimal resource allocation. Guide training curriculum and certification, we mentioned that one. But here's a really important one. I've seen this time and again where there is a tendency to put specifications in a, in a contract that are really unnecessary. I've encountered this person myself, I've seen it um, uh, done elsewhere, where um, contract specification might, might say, you know, thou shalt fly at 15 degree scan angle, for example. Well, that might be appropriate in some situations, but it might not be appropriate for 90% of your survey area for one reason or another. And that's just one specific example. So the, the point here is that we don't want to make standards and guidelines for project specifications so rigid that the service provider is very constrained in terms of their flexibility, because all that's going to do is raise prices for everybody. It's going to take time uh, and increase costs. So we don't want to have standards that are, that are too rigid. We want to have, maintain some level of flexibility. Okay, I want to provide a little bit of context to all of this. So I'm going to discuss um, a little bit about the acquisition workflow. And again, the data acquisition <coughs> workflow, is, is that's a whole lecture in itself. I, I've got a three-hour three can presentation on this. And I'm trying to condense this down to a few slides. But I feel that understanding the acquisition workflow um, helps to guide the specification, at least frame um, some of the important aspects of uh, mission specifications that an end user should be cognizant of. <coughs> so what I have here is uh, two lists. On the left hand side, <coughs> end user tasks. On the right hand side, typical service provider tasks. So this is you know, what I would consider this acquisition workflow. Right from project definition, you know, that's the, the point where an end user or a stakeholder side of things like, well, LIDAR could maybe be a solution to this problem. Whatever it is, flood mapping, forest inventory, highways, urban development, I don't know, you name it. There's lots of possible applications. Uh, and then you might go straight to a provider, or you might go to a data library and access the data, or you might submit a request for proposals. You know, step number two is, is an example. It's, it's not necessarily always done this way. Very often, then, they'll, on the end user, uh, Service provider side, there'll be a proposal submission. 
that goes to proposal review. Then we get into mission planning. Then we get into the actual nuts and bolts of data acquisition. And this is where the specifications actually start to become implemented. So we go through mission planning, data collection, uh, post-processing, delivery, and then we go through a process of uh, quality assurance, quality control, and that's usually a shared responsibility, or it can be a shared responsibility between the service provider and the end user, depending on the comfort levels of, uh, uh, of the end users, typically. And then we move through into the application side of information extraction, decision support, that kind of thing. So that's just a, a basic summary of, uh, of a project workflow without really getting into any details. So mission specifications. This is, um, I just wanted to break it down into this, these three broad areas because these are the kinds of things that a service provider is going to have to consider when they go in and do the data acquisition. So this is the survey area. You know, where is it? Uh, what are the extents? Um, what are the needs in terms of data resolutions? Timing. And I'm going to return to these uh, types of issues again. There are many um, elements of the of timing consideration, both on the technical side and on the environmental side. So, so we'll come back to that. And then specific data requirements. Now, <coughs> I, I'm not going to read through all of these lists, but the, you, these are the kinds of um, areas that an end user needs to be cognizant of because they're going to factor into the service provider's um, mission planning and, and operationalization of the project. Um, survey planning, well, don't pay too much attention to the graphics here. This is just one element of survey planning is the actual acquisition, you know, how do we uh, configure the flight, um, how do we configure the sensor, but there's a lot more to this. You know, there's the deployment of field crews, the deployment of you know, a choice of aircraft, um, where are the, um, which airports are you going to base out of, um, what, what are your ground support needs. Th there's a lot of considerations here. Um, <clears throat> one thing that the um, end user can think about a little bit, but maybe not get too hung up on, the sets of configuration options. These are the kinds of things that we do sometimes see in <coughs> project specifications um, when they go out to tender. And, um, and so it is important to understand a little bit about how the survey, the, the sensor configuration, or the, the data collection configuration, can actually impact the end result, and it does in terms of accuracy. So it's important to understand that. So uh, again, I broke this down into two components, the aircraft and the sensor. We can control the altitude of the aircraft, control the speed that we fly at to some degree, and we can control the, the line configuration, the, the spacing and the overlap of the flight lines. Now on board the sensor, we can control things like the pulse repetition frequency, which directly influences the uh, density, um, which also influences the pulse power. Uh, we can uh, control things like scan angle and scan rate. Now the reason I've got those boxes around pulse repetition and laser power and scan rate and scan angle is because they're interrelated to one another. You vary one, you inherently vary the other one. Uh, and beam divergence. And put all of that together, and that's going to influence your point density, the footprint, footprint size on the ground. Uh, that's the dinner plate that Nicholas was talking about. It could be you know, 20 centimeters, could be a meter or so, depending on the altitude and a few other factors. Um, and the signal strength, or the intensity of the response that you get. Does an end user want to be too consider concerned about these things? Well, it depends. I would say they shouldn't be too concerned about them, but they should at least be aware um, of how these um, configuration components can influence data accuracy and data quality. So then we move on to airborne operations, the actual data acquisition. So again, I've got one of these shopping lists, and I'll just read through it. So first of all, we've got to find a suitable platform. I have about 20 slides that talk about platforms. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, <coughs> install the equipment. If it's something you've done many times before with that airplane, it could take you just an hour. It could take you even less. If it's a new, fresh installation, there are do some modifications, the airplane could be a week or more. Um, you've got to survey the offsets between the GPS antenna and the sensor. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. Ensure that the ground support is ready. You know that the air crew and the ground crew are communicating and, and coordinated. When you actually start the survey, we've got to do some initialization of the GPS. Now, we mentioned that the, the, the quality of the GPS or the position orientation system is critical to the final uh, quality of the data product of the point cloud. And so, you know, you've got to do this right at the time of the mission. Load and configure the survey plan. You're uh, after the races, go collect data. <coughs> now, um, procedures for calibration vary with the service provider. This is something that the end user should at least have reported to them, is how the calibration is performed. Um, 
Now this can vary. I'm not going to go into all the different ways you can do this, but um, a lot of providers decide to do a check of the calibration um, at the beginning of the end of every flight. Uh, and that's a good, uh, a good practice to get into. Not every provider does that, but it's nice to have that check. And, um, and if that check is performed, it's good to have those, um, those uh, results reported back to the end user as part of the uh, final data collection uh, report. Once the data is collected, land, download data, it's ready for post-processing. So what's the Air One operations going? What's the ground crew doing? Well, setting up and deploying base stations, collecting calibration and validation data, processing data. Normally, maybe you've got a mission that takes a few weeks, so we've got some of the ground crew doing ground support, part of the ground crew might be collecting data, uh, uh, sorry, processing data in the field. Um, <coughs> and of course, client interaction. Now, I mentioned processing data because it's, uh, it's important to do some kind of initial quality control, some, type of, uh, some uh, level of um, processing of the data quickly after data collection, um, just to make sure that everything's there, everything has worked okay. It's not all just packed up and shipped back to the office and processed uh, you know, days, weeks, months after the fact. Data integration. <coughs> um, download the data, pre-process the calibration, trajectory processing, points integration. Those are the kinds of steps that you can do in the field. Um, and you know, they don't really take that long anymore. Like, this whole workflow has sped up quite a lot. I mean, it used to be the case that you'd go out, you'd uh, collect one hour of data, and you'd spend 20 hours just, just getting to that stage. Now, things are a lot more efficient. Um, processing you know, an hour of data collection might take you an hour or two hours to get to that stage in the field. But then there's a lot you can do after that. Um, the, you know, the project management setting up the uh, tile arrays uh, for batch processing, uh, cleaning, quality assurance, strip matching or bundle adjustment where we try to align the flight lines in a, in a post-process mode. Uh, points classification, we touched on that yesterday. There's uh, a lot of different uh, classification um, uh, algorithms out there and different uh, classes that data can be uh, assigned to. Uh, data modeling and DEMs digital service models, character models, that kind of thing, and outputs and backup. Most of that actually occurs back at the, the office because it's a little bit more involved, a little bit more time consuming. Uh, a little bit about calibration. I want to touch on this because it is a very important topic overall. I mean, it ultimately, it um, ensures that the, that the sensor is um, operating optimally, that all of the components are internally aligned with one another and that we can um, at least get the, the, best, uh, the best shot of good quality data. And so this is, uh, there's a number of components to it, but we're just, the, the bore site is concerned with the, um, uh, the angular misalignments between the inertial measurement unit and the scanner mirror that we discussed yesterday. And uh, so one of the ways we do that is to fly over a building you know, uh, or predetermined targets and try to align with those targets. The easiest thing to do is to identify an edge a building, so you would survey that uh, well-defined edge in brake line on a building, and then you would fly over that and identify that brake line within, the, within your data. Um, so you fly over it in a profile configuration so that you can make sure that the pitch alignment um, is correct relative to the aircraft, and then you would fly parallel to that edge so that you can make sure the roll alignment uh, is also uh, <coughs> perfectly aligned. So that's, that's kind of a system calibration. That's something you'll do before the data acquisition, and then you'll check it after the data acquisition. But there are many other elements of, of misalignments. It's not all just about the bore site. You can have a perfect bore site, but you might have some errors propagated because of the GPS uh, or the uh, or drift in the IMU, um, <coughs> or, or other uh, random errors. And so you're going to account for those in a post-process bundle just to the strips. <coughs> and then data output options many, many um, options for outputting and delivering the data. Um, we heard yesterday about uh, datums and projections, of course, standard geographic survey stuff. Configuration of the data, do we want flight lines or do we want tiles? <coughs> Usually we want tiles, but you know, there are some projects that don't require tiles. Um, sometimes uh, an end user might be limited in terms of the individual file sizes. You know, for example, um, as a service provider, I might be quite happy to provide you a tile um, array where each tile is 500 megabytes. As a, an end user, you might not be comfortable with file, you know, individual file sizes of 500 megabytes. 
So we might want to scale the size down to such an extent that we don't exceed a certain file size. Or file size might be somewhat irrelevant to you, and you might just want to deal with certain spatial units, you know, like one kilometer, 1.5 kilometer, two kilometer uh, units, because that just makes much sense to you from a data management point of view. But those things need to be thought out. Are you dealing with file size restrictions, or are you dealing with spatial extent restrictions in terms of delivery? <coughs> what information do you need embedded within those files? Um, GPS scan angle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of information you can embed in there. Uh, point classification scheme. There are some standards or guidelines associated with point classifications. Uh, do you want to adhere to those externally defined classification, or do you want to create your own classification scheme and specify that to the service provider? Uh, data density and decimation. You know, what, what data density do you want? Now, it might be that you don't want one hit per square meter over all of your survey area. You might want a different data density or a different particular application or a different particular land cover. So that's something to think out a little bit. And then <coughs> what actual file format do you want the data delivered in? I think we've heard a little bit about LAS already. Uh, that appears to be coming the de facto standard in terms of uh, binary file formats, but it isn't the only one. And a lot of end users are very comfortable using ASCII file formats. Uh, there's a new format coming out, uh, an ASTM E57, uh, format, but that's a more generic 3D point cloud format. It's not necessarily specific to uh, airborne laser scanning data, whereas LAS is, at least traditionally, has been fairly focused on airborne laser scanning data. And then, of course, there are proprietary formats uh, that meet very specific needs. Uh, data models. Do you want DEMs? Do you want DSMs? Do you want canopy high models? Do you want building models? You know, and so on and so forth. Do you want these things plotting or deliverable? And then derivative features. Do you want break lines? Do you want contour? And, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Do you want wet areas, mapping, uh, derivatives? You know, there, there's many other types of derivatives that you could have, and so you have to ask yourself, are these the kind of things we want to do in-house, or are these the kind of things we want to contract out to the service provider? Because it might be more efficient to do that. It might be quicker and more cost-effective to get those derivatives um, at the point of delivery. <coughs> okay, so end-user challenges. Now, this, this section this is probably where the real meat and potatoes of the presentation is. We could spend a lot of time just talking about end user challenges. Um, fortunately, uh, I mean, I've been watching the industry for 13 years now. And this was a really big topic 13 to five years ago. But I think, I think the communication between the various stakeholders in the communities is improving to a point where yeah. this isn't as big of a deal as it used to be. But it's still a very important issue. So what are some of the pitfalls that end users encounter after delivery? And we can uh, list off a few here. Um, in our inadequate project specification. Now, whose fault is that? Well, let's not get into fault of it or blame. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. But often a project isn't specified um, in enough detail for the service provider to meet the end user needs. That has happened many times. Um, it's not one's fault. It's just a communication deficit. Limited in-house uh, uh, LIDAR experience and resource. Um, interestingly, I, I've dealt with a lot of colleagues in federal and provincial government um, where they've got one LIDAR expert in-house and then that one person gets really dumped on. You know, they, they, you know, they're the, the go-to person. And, uh, and I think that can be um, somewhat challenging. So, that, you know, so there's a deficit there in terms of training uh, or there's a need for training. <coughs> Data storage and management, though, another one of the topics that came up yesterday was, I mean, LIDAR's not unique in terms of generating large volumes of data, but it, it can generate large volumes of data. And if you're coming at this from a, from a survey or cartographic perspective as opposed to a large scale or sensing perspective, you might not be used to dealing with such large volumes of data. So you might have to suddenly you know, totally retool your um, data management um, procedures. <coughs> and then inefficient and uh, inefficient analysis and modeling workflows. Yesterday I mentioned uh, that brief example of uh, provincial biomass modeling. Um, some of Nicholas' examples were also very good. Um, you know, taking the point cloud all the way through the derivative products, you can see some of the steps involved there. Um, fusion came up. Well, the, you know, the, the point there is how many bits of software do we actually need in order to get from the point cloud to the information? for decision support and information of uh, uh, land management, whatever it is we're trying to do on the back end. <coughs> so, going to be a lot of software, um, 
that can cost money in terms of licenses, that can require a lot of expertise that might not exist in-house. So we need to think about those internal workflows. How do we actually um, optimize those workflows? And data quality. And, and that's probably the really big one, is how do we ensure data quality? How do we define what data quality is? And so I've got another little section that's dedicated to that. So in terms of project specification, you know, th this really is the end user's responsibility. You know, when you're specifying a project, you know, if you're going to put it, a, put it out for bid, put it out for tender, or if you're going to go to a data library, and you, you, you've got to, at least internally, have some idea of what your needs are and come up with some kind of project specification. <coughs> uh, one of the challenges we often see is that there are very limited accuracy specs. Um, back in the kind of Wild West days of LiDAR, I remember this 15 centimeter RMS or 15 centimeter signal was this kind of um, golden rule of thumb that you would hear quoted all the time. Uh, fortunately, you don't hear that so much anymore because I think the community is a lot smarter than that. But the problem would be, um, given that's what the manufacturers would state as being the nominal accuracy. And they'd state it as a sigma, so really what they're talking about is a precision. They're talking about repeatability. They're not talking about absolute accuracy. But the problem is, um, a lot of end users would get the, end, the, the wrong impression. They'd think, okay, 15 centimeter accuracy, well, that's great. But then they'd get a data acquisition over a floodplain, um, they'd be dealing with RMSs at a close to a meter, uh, wondering, well, why am I getting this 15 centimeters on those promise? Well, anyway, I think we're well beyond that now, but um, <coughs> the, the challenge there is it's not that difficult to demonstrate a 15 centimeter sigma. You know, uh, most systems are going to deliver that very easily. But if you want it in a floodplain that's densely vegetated, you're not likely to get that level of accuracy. So you need to be careful on how accuracy uh, is specified. <coughs> um, and uh, this feeds into the next issue, that the expectations can be too high. Um, and so you, you don't want to over-specify the accuracy. If you really want that 15 centimeters in the floodplain, you're probably not going to get it. Or for a service provider to achieve that 15 centimeter accuracy in that area, they might have to go to some absurd level of um, data density, or they might have to fly so low, or they, they, they might have to constrain the project so much that it becomes cost prohibitive. So you've got to be a little bit practical about these things. You know, don't, don't set the expectations too high. Don't set the specification too, too high. Uh, same goes with density as accuracy. If you don't need half meter postings, don't specify it. Why pay for something you don't need? <coughs> Incorrect extent. Now, this is something I've seen time and time again. Is um, Interestingly enough, mostly in the utilities and the highway, corridor survey sector where there'll be a design project um, at that moment in time the design is for a I don't know, two or five or ten kilometer section of highway and so the DOT will just put out a tender for that two kilometer section of highway but of course the service provider is smart they know well if they're doing that this year next year they're going to be doing a bit down you know a little bit further down and so on and so forth it costs if you're already up in the air in the area and you're flying you know, a couple of kilometers of line, it costs you next to nothing to fly 100 kilometers of line. If you're already doing, you've already mobilized and deployed a whole crew for that one or two kilometers, it's negligible to fly an extra 100. Well, <coughs> if you're the end user, you might as well just bite the bullet and say, let's fly this whole corridor right now because it's going to cost us an outside less to do it now than it will to re-tender uh, re it next year. Um, and that's a real issue because the service provider is clever. They've got the data in the can, but you'll still have to pay for it next time around. So, uh, you know, think about the, the bigger picture uh, and, and, and be efficient in terms of the areas that are required. <coughs> Suboptimal classification post process. And what I mean by that is um, a lot of times you'll see a project delivered where the, the, it's just the point cloud. And it, it's demonstrated that the point cloud has, uh, has met a certain level of accuracy, or maybe it's gone to the point of ground classification. But um, but then the user decides, well, actually, we need we need breakpoints, <coughs> or we need other classifications, we need building classification, and so on and so forth. But that wasn't part of the project spec. So then you're faced with a challenge: you either have to do that in house, but you might not have the resources to do it, or you've got to go back to the provider and you've got to say, well, could you do this for us now? 
Well, if you go back after you've already spent the project and they've got the data in house, you're a little bit stuck over a barrel. It might cost you a lot more to do that. So, so again, think about the bigger picture. What are you ultimately going to want in, in your project? Uh, is it more efficient to contract out those kind of you know secondary derivatives of the data uh, to the service provider, or you know be sure about your internal capacity to actually do those things for yourself? Uh, little thought to survey time. The, the reason I bring that up, um, service providers are extremely cognizant of, of timing um, and the limitations to time. You know, the influences of weather, the influence of, of tides, uh, GPS windows, uh, ground coverages, foliage, snow, ground saturation, these kinds of things. All of these uh, environmental and technical parameters influence the timing of a survey. If you don't specify those things as an end user, it's possible that um, you'll end up with a data collection uh, where you're only getting 30% of the ground returns because it was collected during the leaf on, when you could have been getting 70% of the ground returns if you just waited a bit longer or if you flew a little bit earlier. So you know there are some uh, critical aspects of timing that probably should be within the uh, project specification. <coughs> 